So the, the, tackle that, the issue that we're going to be tackling today is the war for children's minds. Now, what right do children have to freedom of thought and expression and to freedom of religion or belief? Are they the property of their parents? Who should be free to mould them as they wish? Does the state have any duty to protect children from what it, and the majority of the population, sees as warped views? If so, where do the powers of the state end? What protects us from totalitarianism? Is education part of an, the economic system, ensuring a supply of trained workers? Or is it a subversive process of training children in critical thinking, wherever it leads? What is the law in the UK and elsewhere internationally on children's rights and parents' rights and the duties and powers of the school and state? And what should it be? Now, to tackle these very difficult issues, we are uh, privileged to have two excellent speakers with us today. The first is uh, Stephen Law. Stephen is an English philosopher and a member of the BHA's Humanist Philosophers Group. And he's been the provost of the Centre for, Quir for Inquiry UK which is now a division of the BHA um, since 2008 and is the editor of the philosophical journal Think. Now, he's written a number of uh, popular introductory books, including three children's philosophy books. And his The War for Children's Minds, um, very apt <laughs> given the title of this session, is a strong defence of a liberal approach to education. <laughs> Philip Pullman said that the book should be read by every teacher, every parent and every politician. Malcolm Evans is the Professor of Public International Law at Bristol University. His areas of research interest now lie primarily in issues concerning the international protection of human rights, with a particular focus on the freedom of religion and the prevention of torture. He's the currently chair of the UN Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture and is a member of the UK Foreign Secretary's Advisory Group on Human Rights. Among his many books are Religious Liberty and International Law in Europe. So, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Stephen Law and Malcolm Evans. Yeah. Um, we'll begin with. Oh, oops, the lights off. Go um, we'll begin with a, a presentation first from Stephen, followed by a presentation from Malcolm, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions from the floor. <laughs> right, uh, can you hear me okay in the back? Okay, if at any point my voice starts... Mm, okay. If at any point uh, my voice starts to not be annoying, just let me know, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll do my best to project to the back. So, um, I'm very pleased to be here, very uh, kind of the uh, Congress to invite me, and in particular for a session on which has the same title as my book. <laughs> Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take you through uh, some of the ideas in the book. I've put this PowerPoint together uh, this morning. I suspect I have too many slides. We'll see how far we go. Okay, so uh, to begin with, um, it seems to me, this is true, that before uh, the 1960s, many children, not all, but many children in many schools, were expected to accept more or less uncritically what they were told about religion and about morality. Uh, some, I think many, uh, religious educators had a rather big brother attitude uh, when it came to not just children's behaviour, but what they were thinking. Um, thoughts were policed. Uh, negative thoughts were monitored and dealt with. Um, People who often encouraged a sense of their own thoughts. I have a, a friend of mine, uh, a colleague of mine, tells me that uh, even today, 35 years after her Catholic education is complete, she still feels guilty if she dares to think that her thoughts critical of Roman Catholicism, despite the fact that she's no longer a Roman Catholic. It's still working, self censorship is still shooting away. In her mind. So the, the schools were very effective, the people at most were very effective in, in establishing patterns of thought, in getting certain roadblocks set up in her mind so that thoughts wouldn't really 
in certain directions. And things have changed, I think, to a, a large extent during the second half of the 20th century. Western societies have become much more liberal, and indeed individuals have been encouraged very often to throw off the old mental straitjackets and to start thinking independently and critically and autonomously. And of course, this has been reflected in the kind of moral education that uh, children have received. But not everyone has been completely happy uh, about that. Um, many people think that we've gone too far, that we've become too liberal. Uh, they claim that if you look around, Western civilization is beginning to collapse, <coughs> morally speaking. The, the moral foundations are beginning to crumble. And it's because we went too far in the liberal direction. We've allowed the moral foundations of Western civilization to be, to be weakened and eroded. And we need to do something about that. It is a common refrain. It's needed. Um, we need to bring authority back into the classroom. There has been a collapse of authority, and we need, at least to some extent, to reinstate authority, <coughs> particularly religious authority, back uh, in the classroom. And so you find a great deal of enthusiasm for faith schools amongst successive UK governments, and I think that that is in part motivated by the thought that at least faith schools are providing that moral foundation which is otherwise uh, lacking. <coughs> so in the book, um, what I do is I argue that we should be very liberal indeed, actually, in our approach to moral and religious education. Um, and all I'm going to do here really is, is to clarify a liberal approach to moral education and look at one popular but bad anti-liberal uh, argument. So, uh, let me begin by clarifying uh, what I mean by liberal and authoritarian. I'm going to use a capital A for authoritarian and a capital L, liberal, to make it clear that I'm using these words in a slightly technical way, which is the way that I'm explaining up here on the slide. I'm suggesting that authoritarians believe that individuals should be raised to more or less uncritically accept the moral and religious viewpoint that is presented to them. Uh, young people are passive receptacles into which we pour the appropriate moral and religious beliefs. And it is their job to just sit there and accept it. Okay? We hope that it accepts and that will turn them into good moral citizens. The liberal, by contrast, thinks that individuals should be encouraged to think and question, not just passively and uncritically accept. Uh, liberals very often place great importance on encouraging individuals not just to think for themselves, but to for them to realise that it is their duty to think for themselves, it is their duty to make their own moral judgments rather than defer to some external authority that might then make that judgment for them. And liberals then think that it's very important that we get young people to you know, foster the skills in them, they're going to need to discharge that responsibility properly. So we need to make sure that they are good critical thinkers, that, uh, that they can think about issues, moral issues and other issues dispassionately and carefully and come to a well-informed and considered judgment. That being their responsibility. So that's what I mean by liberal and authoritarian. And it seems that there's a scale. Okay, You can be more or less liberal, more or less authoritarian. And I think that schools back in the 1950s and 1940s were pretty authoritarian with a capital A when it comes to moral and religious education, but we've moved in the liberal direction over the last half century or so. Uh, there are now complaints that we've come too far in this direction, uh, in that direction, and we need to start moving back in the authoritarian direction. I take it, given that this is an IHEU Congress event, that probably <coughs> most of you are on the left-hand side of the scale. Off the scale. Off the scale. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. I'm yeah, I'm going to be arguing, uh, seemingly pointlessly, <laughs> that um, you should certainly be um, on the left-hand side of the scale. Now, uh, there's another issue that we need to separate out immediately, which is 
Um, the division, the distinction between an authoritarian and liberal with a small a and a small l, as I shall now use these terms. So now, what I'm concerned with on this other axis is uh, not freedom of thought and, ex and expression, but freedom of action. Okay? Should children be allowed to do whatever they like? No. <laughs> uh, no, we are not necessarily promoting anarchy in the classroom, a hands-off approach in which children just run free and do whatever they want with no discipline whatsoever. That would be very liberal with a small L. Okay? Um, if you run a boot camp style regime, on the other hand, in your school, that's very authoritarian with a small A. You're really controlling the behaviour. But there's a big difference between controlling behaviour and having rules and discipline, which no doubt are very important, and controlling what's going on in their heads, trying to police and control and manipulate that. And it seems to me that if we put the two scales together now, you could see that you could be like Sally in the top left-hand corner there. She's, she's a strict disciplinarian, right? When it comes to behaviour, uh, her children are expected to behave very well indeed. And there are a lot of rules and regulations perhaps in her school and in her home. But still, she's very liberal with a capital L because she encourages her children to express their own views, to question the rules that she nevertheless imposes on them. She actually gives them that opportunity to discuss them and think about them. And she explains to them why the rules are there, but she allows them to come back and ask further questions and they engage in critical discussion. In, in many ways, that's a very liberal with a capital L approach to education, even whilst being quite authoritarian in the small way. Now, so the, the reason I'm putting this chart up is because so often, right, if you suggest that children should be encouraged to think and question, you will be accused of being some sort of anarchist, right? You're just saying children can just do whatever they want in the classroom. No, 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 that's not it at all. You completely misunderstood what position I'm defending if you think that that's what I'm promoting. So that's the first distinction I really want to make. Request for louder speaking. Louder speaking, okay. I'll try. <coughs> the other uh, myth that I want to nail at the outset is this, it's that um, liberals like me must necessarily be against religion and religious schools. No, not actually. You can be religious and be pretty liberal with a capital L. In fact, you could have a faith school that was pretty liberal with a capital L. You could say, these are our Christian beliefs, and these are the reasons why we hold these beliefs, but make up your own mind. Think for yourself. Uh, and indeed, we'll give you plenty of opportunity to engage in a critical discussion, and we'll allow you to hear other people that don't agree, other points of view will allow you to hear their arguments too, and then you make up your own mind, but you know, this is our position, this is the position that we are promoting. That would be a religious school, but it would be a really very liberal with a capital L school. And it seems to me that all schools should be liberal, whether or not they are religious. You may not like religious schools, I'm not a big fan, but I'm, the, the, the thing I'm focusing on here is let's be liberal, irrespective of our religious um, atheists can, of course, be authoritarian with a capital A, can't they? Easy to forget, isn't it? Easy to forget how many there have been. Um, so there's North Korea, obviously atheist, and very authoritarian indeed. You're going to be in big trouble if you fail to express uh, atheist points of view uh, in the classroom. Uh, in Stalinist, Stalinist Russia, you know, the knock in the, the feared knock on the door in the middle of the night would come from those who wish to police thoughts. But you know, it's not like the Holy Inquisition where they were police policing religious thoughts and making sure you had religious thoughts and were expressing religious thoughts of you. No, exactly the opposite in this case. It seems to me that, that those regimes have a very unhealthy and dangerous obsession with thought control. And that is what I'm arguing against. And let's not forget that atheists have historically not humanists, mm -hmm. right? That's something completely different. Atheists, many atheists, have been authoritarians with a capital I. Any humanist is an enemy for authoritarian humans with a capital I. <coughs> so, uh, here's another little chart 
for you then. So I've got the same left, right, liberal, authoritarian axis there for you, and we're all over there on the left, right? I hope. Uh, and then, and there's Richard Dawkins down there, uh, he's an atheist, so he's at the bottom of the vertical scale there. He's clearly very atheistic. Take his views. So I'm stuck in the bottom left hand corner. But you know, uh, Keith Ward, who's a friend of mine, who's a former professor emeritus of divinity at the University of Oxford, obviously a religious person, I said to Keith, Where are you on my scale? And he said, Top left hand corner. Okay? He's, he's in our gang. Right? He's in the liberal club, and yet he is religious. Uh, on the other side, of course, at the top, you have religious authoritarians, perhaps some folks. Thank you very much, I've about which ones. Uh, but uh, clearly, there are many religious authoritarians uh, around to this day in this country. Um, but of course, there are atheistic authoritarians with a capital A, too, so I've got Joe Stalin in the bottom right hand corner. And it seems to me that over the last few decades, there's been an awful lot of smoke and heat generated by a battle, uh, the battle between the people at the bottom and the people at the top. Richard Dawkins lets go with a salvo northwards, and then there's return of fire, and before you know it, it's heat and smoke, and we have entirely lost sight of the more <coughs> important battle, surely, which is the battle between people on the left and the back here and people on the right. It seems to me that we must not lose sight of the more important disputes. And in fact, we should probably be looking to build alliances with religious liberals <coughs> uh, against those on the right hand side, some of whom, let's not forget, are atheists. So that's one of the distinctions that I make in the book, um, which I think is very important. I'm not saying you can't argue against religion, I'm just saying don't lose sight of this other more fundamental uh, battle. <coughs> so the next thing I'm going to do, uh, briefly, is to look at um, what I think is probably by far the most popular argument against being liberal nowadays. This is the argument that you find trotted out again and again, you know, in the pages of the Daily Telegraph, uh, when you listen to the Moral Maze on Radio Tour, wherever they happen to be. If there are people involved in the debate who are fairly authoritarian with a capital A, chances are they are going to run the following argument. So I just want to kind of set out their concerns before uh, we deal with them. A few years ago, back in 2004, a think tank, the International, sorry, the Institute of Public Policy Research, the IPPR, recommended that uh, children, all children in all schools, should be encouraged to think critically about the views, the world views that they're bringing into the classroom, including their religious views. Uh, and that's a very liberal recommendation. I'm all for that, okay? But not everyone was. The Daily Telegraph really didn't like it. And neither did, uh, and neither did Melanie Phillips. Some of you may be familiar with Melanie Phillips. She said about the recommendation, this is a nothing other than yet another attempt that ideological indoctrination it reflects the belief that parents who pass on the Christian faith are guilty of indoctrinating their children. And that is the role of the state, that it is the role of the state to stop them. The IPPR and its allies in the government are not so much interested in promoting diversity as in replacing one set of orthodoxies by another, the joyless ideology of cultural relativism. That's what you got. <laughs> and by promoting it, you're bringing about the collapse of Western civilization. There's only one to So, okay, so Melanie Phillips is not obviously a professional philosopher, and this is knockabout stuff, but still, um, she's no fool, and she's one amongst many people that express this kind of view on a regular basis. Um, so, you know, what if anything is wrong with it? Really, that's just what I'm going to look at here. Um, so, by relativism, Melody Phillips and, and I mean uh, the view that when it comes to morality, it's moral relativism that we're talking about, there's no objective truth with a capital T, right? There are just subjective preferences or points of view. It's a bit like the deliciousness of wittity rugs. So, when 
Katie Price, formerly known as Jordan, the glamour model, was expected to keep a hitchity buzz live on line of celebrity getting out of here. She said it was the worst experience of her life, worse than childbirth, right? She said <laughs> it's pretty bad. Um, whereas other people, um, perhaps those uh, native to Australia, are to that continent, they might think that they're rather tasty. What's the delicacy? <laughs> Okay, sorry, I have it in your authority that they consider them a delicate. <laughs> okay, so what's the truth then about the deliciousness of witchy belts? Is it true or false that they're delicious? And the answer is there ain't no truth with a capital T. There's your truth, there's my truth. There are different perspectives, different points of view. So some truths are relative. The relativist about morality says and disso morality, right? There are different moral perspectives and they're all equally valid, they're all equally true. There's your truth, there's my truth, but they're not objective truth when it comes to morality. And what Melanie Phillips thinks that liberals are promoting is that. Right? That's what she thinks that liberals are pushing in schools. Some are, actually. Like, that's a bad thing. <laughs> it is a bad thing. <laughs> in my opinion. So that's, that's what, yeah, okay. So, uh, let's have a look at some other expressions of Intent for this promotion of relativism. Um, so this is a form of artificial Canterbury. Uh, beware the dangers of moral relativism and privatised morality. There's a widespread tendency to view what is good and right as a matter of private taste and individual opinion only. Under this tendency, God is banished to the realm of a private hobby and religion becomes a particular activity for those who happen to have a taste for it. It's like a taste. Subjective preference. Okay. Um, uh, Richard Lamb, <laughs> former governor of Colorado, um, says, in attempting to be tolerant, we have wiped out all the rules. It's hard these days to find a standard which we can hold to which we can hold people. Everything is relative. Our moral compass gyrates wildly. There is no truth or true north. But history shows us this is not a sustainable uh, trait. Another typical expression of this concern. Uh, Richard Land, who's a, 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 an American minister on Adam Gray and what happened there, he said, this is not a breakdown in the system, this reflects a breakdown in society. These people's moral compass didn't work for some reason. My guess is because they've been infected <laughs> with uh, relativism. It's like a disease, like a cancer, eating away at the foundations of Western civilization. And who's to blame? You are. <laughs> so we <we're the> <laughs> Uh, Pat Buchanan, liberals, government, governing axioms, reduce faith to superstition and traditional morality to quite nonsense, no fixed standards of right or wrong, beautiful or debased, healthy or sick, if it feels good, do it. Uh, the mob listens and today we reap relativism, poison harvest. It's very flowery language we need to express this very serious concern which so many people across the West have, that somehow terrible, terrible damage is being done by liberals. Um, so, you know, basically this is your choice. You can bring back authority with a capital A, a capital A back into the classroom, or you can promote relativism and bring about the end of Western civilization. Now, these are your options. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so, actually, so now I'll just I'll set out a little bit why, uh, why I'm not a big fan of relativism. Not many professional philosophers sign up to moral relativism, uh, often for the kind of reasons I'm about to explain. Um, sometimes relativists say, ah, oh, but you know, you've got to be a relativist because you know you want to promote tolerance, don't you? It's a, it's a kind of a important virtue. We don't want to go around the world ramming our moral perspective down other cultures' throats. You know, that's cultural imperialism, and we don't want to be doing that. So let's let's be relativists instead. That's a really terrible argument for being relativist. Um, in fact, if you genuinely think that tolerance is a universal virtue, you must reject relativism. Otherwise, you have to say that for those people that like to condemn homosexuals, gay people to death for being gay, that hey, if that works for them, yeah, go right ahead. Uh, you're going to have to tolerate their horrendous intolerance and say, that's just as true as my position because I'm a moral relativist. You really don't want to be saying that, uh, actually. Um, relativists, only relativists allow for our moral fallibility. 
Now, exactly the opposite is true. Relativists, relativism makes us morally infallible, if you think about it for a second, right? If, if, if you know, you can't be wrong about the deliciousness of the witches you've got, but if you think it's delicious, it is, right? That makes it delicious. Similarly, if you think that killing is wrong, and what makes it wrong is the fact that you think it is so, then you can't make a mistake, morally speaking. No one ever gets it wrong, morally speaking. If you believe that it is possible to make a mistake, morally speaking, either an individual or is it a culture, then you should reject moral relativism. Um, often, the relativism is applied in an inconsistent manner. Um, so, for example, when some rainforest tribe engage in some practice that some Westerners find a bit uh, distasteful, um, the relativists will say, oh no, well, you know, you shouldn't judge. You shouldn't point the finger. You know, that's true for them. You have your morality, they have their morality. Um, but when some multinational then goes into that rainforest and chops it all down and barbecues the inhabitants, they don't say, oh, well, you know, that works for you. You go right in the No, no, suddenly, stop. What are you doing? That's wrong with a capital W, right? So there's a completely inconsistent approach being taken by those very often who promote more relativism. And they pick and choose how they, how they apply the relativism. And often they, there's a kind of a finger pointing that goes on. You, know, you, you, you shouldn't judge those Somalians that practice female circumcision. If they point the finger at you and judge you, right, they are clearly doing the very thing that they're telling you you shouldn't be doing, making more judgments about how they're So they're hypocrites, in other words. They're simply being inconsistent in their own position. So, so my advice is don't be a moral relativist. Uh, but then you don't have to be as a liberal. You can be news. Uh, liberalism is not the same thing as moral relativism. Um, you can certainly take the view that there's a, you know, there's a fact of the matter about what's right and what's wrong, and yet still think that the best, you know, each person must make their own judgment about what the objective truth is. And that's a perfectly reasonable liberal position to take. It's the position that you find in the sciences, of course. The sciences are remarkably liberal. The scientists are encouraged to think and question, and if they think that something is wrong, to say so, to test the hypothesis and make their own judgment. Uh, it's a very liberal position, that doesn't mean that whatever any scientist decides is true, is then true <laughs> for them. It doesn't make scientific truth relative to a liberal culture in science. So similarly, a liberal culture in morality doesn't mean, doesn't entail that we be relativists about truth. In fact, we shouldn't be. Because if we think that there is some point to thinking about right and wrong, in terms of getting closer to what's true, then you have to reject relativism. If relativism is true, the conclusion that you come to after careful thought is no more true than the one you started off with. They're all true. Say so there's no point in thinking about it at all. It doesn't matter which position you take. There's, who thinks that? Nobody. Certainly no one in this room. So none of you should be signing up to relativism about truth, but you should be signing up to liberalism. And you should be very aware of the fact that when people criticise a liberal perspective, invariably they will smear you as a relativist. Nine times out of ten, in some cases, you will be a relativist, of course. Uh, but most liberals uh, are not relativists, and certainly you shouldn't be uh, a moral relativist, uh, in my opinion. Um, can you me? So, um, so there's a myth then. We stick with relativism and slide into moral oblivion, or we go back to authority with a capital A in the classroom. These are not our own options. Um, we could be liberal with a capital A. So what have I done? I just explained what I mean by liberal. <coughs> L. Is that a capital A? Yeah, I think it's a backpack or something there. Uh, we should be liberal with a capital L. Right? Um, uh, the, that's the important thing. Um, that's what I argue for in the book. Have I given you any reason whatsoever to be liberal with a capital L thus far? No, not a single reason. So that's, uh, that's your homework. <laughs> yeah, that's your homework. You're going to have to think to yourselves and figure out why it is that we ought to be liberal. I, there are loads, if you, loads of reasons in the book, obviously. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to supply those arguments now because I'm out of time. I've just really made a concept, some conceptual clarifications because that's what it's going to do. And um, shot down probably the most popular argument.
against being liberal, that there is the one that Logan put its wrong, the Telegraph Times, and so on. It's a terrible argument. It's based on a simple muddle. Don't let them get away with it. <laughs> to move now from um, what children's rights should look like to how they are articulated in practice. And for that, we have Malcolm Evans. Sorry, we, yeah, we, we should try our best to make sure we're, we're speaking now. Is it health and safety? Okay. Thank you, Mike. Okay, is everyone able to hear me? <laughs> <laughs> On the whole, many people don't necessarily like what I say, but they always hear what I say. <laughs> It's one way of getting by in a complex world. Um, perhaps I should start off again by stressing uh, what I am and possibly what I'm not. Um, as was said in the um, introduction, by profession, I'm a public international lawyer who, over the years, has come to focus on two particular issues, um, the freedom of international protections of the freedom of religion and belief, and also issues to do with torture and torture prevention. And I do have to stress there is no particular connection between the two. <laughs> Although I was once quite amused at being, yes, and embarrassed, at being introduced as a specialist in, I quote, torture preventing religious liberty. <laughs> <laughs> but I can handle that because I'm used to dealing with confused categories. Um, and I will admit, as I go into the few remarks I'm going to be making now, um, which were informed by a reading of uh, Stephen's book and the title and the abstract for this, um, for this session as circulated, I may be in the middle of a little bit of a category confusion myself, or perhaps I'm not. Um, as I understand it, the, if you like, underlying purpose of this afternoon's discussion is to consider issues concerning education. Um, and Stephen has introduced, and his book introduces, different approaches uh, veering between authoritarianism and liberalism within education, but also, perhaps, questions to do with the place of religious education as it affects the understanding in children's minds of matters to do with broader questions of morality. And so behind all this, perhaps I'm wondering, we do have this discussion between liberalism and authoritarianism in education, or is it within religious education? I will admit I'm not entirely sure. And it is, of course, notable that, as Stephen rightly mentions in his book and in his presentation, the critiques of liberal education which are, are given and discussed are often chosen to be those which are drawn from um, particular religious authoritarian perspectives. Of course, others could have been chosen in order to make the points which have been drawn from what Stephen rightly indicates are the authoritarian tendencies in other systems of, of, of belief. And so I do think we need to be a little bit careful about what we are talking about. Are we talking about liberalism and authoritarianism in education generally, or are we talking something about how education in the eyes of some is used as a vehicle for the inculcating of certain views on morality which are religiously infused? And I think there are elements of both going on uh, within, this, that, uh, within this discussion. Um, Stephen's fascinating book, um, which does indeed deserve to be uh, widely read, concludes with, as he has today, a clear call to renounce authority-based moral and religious education, that is, authority with the capital A. Um, 
Now, much of the argument concerns this liberal approach to education in general and is applicable, as I've already said, to any form of authority-based approaches to education. And I do understand and stress that an authority-based approach to education, as it has been presented, means an approach which is premised on an unquestioning adherence to a dogma and a refusal to countenance the questioning of the assumptions on which that dogma is based or the conclusions which others have drawn from it. In short, perhaps we could paraphrase this, this strong version of authoritarianism as an approach that boils down to, don't think about what I say, just accept it. Now, it really is not difficult to agree with criticisms of such form of education. Um, Though I will say, and again, Stephen has indicated the way things have changed over the years, it is difficult to accept that this is the nature of education in the majority of schools, religious or otherwise, that we have within the UK today. Although I'm sure we will all um, understand the tendency and temptation when the going get tough to resort to that famous expression, just don't think about it, just do it. Um, and, uh, you know, we are alive to, to that. But it is not difficult to agree with the criticism of authoritarian um, approaches to education, be, in, be they of any nature or in schools, religious schools or otherwise. Now I'm not saying that I don't think there are such instances, but I think it is perhaps setting up something of a, of a straw man to suggest that such forms of authoritarianism reflect the lived reality for most within the educational system uh, today. But we mustn't discount its existence. I think also, if I'm being entirely honest, that when we move beyond that to the question of how we deal with the difficult questions around education and the vital question of moral and, yes, religious education, to approach this from a perspective perhaps of a, of a conflict paradigm, indeed the title War for Children's Minds arguably gets us off to quite a poor start, to be honest, in my view. I think it's not particularly helpful to project children and their moral and intellectual development as some sort of object or battlefield over and upon which others are engaged in some sort of intellectual or ideological struggle. There is a danger within this that it is an approach that can instrumentalise both education and children themselves. Indeed, thinking about it in these terms of a ground over which other people have a contest could encourage the very thing which it purports to uh, reject, focusing on questions such as who or what is having the greatest influence and if it is not the thing which is the thing to my or your taste how might this be changed? To me, that seems to be the antithesis of what a liberal with a big L education really should, should, should be about. And I completely buy into the vision of the big L liberal education. I say that really because I think there are other starting points which I feel might offer similar outcomes um, but perhaps get there from a rather different perspective and as an international lawyer it is a perspective that I feel more comfortable with because indeed it reflects the uh, world in which I come from which is one of a rights-based approach. And what I want to do um, in the time that's available to me now is just to go through the essence of what has emerged as a rights-based approach to the question of children's education, and in particular, the question of moral stroke religious education from a, a legal perspective. I know this will not enable us to answer, in this point, all the detailed questions that have been posed to us at the beginning, but it may provide a different framework from within which, within which to be able to begin to find an answer to them. Um, the, this starting point, as I say, to me, offers similar outcomes, but from a rather different perspective. And there is, in fact, a surprisingly clear international legal framework, which I feel needs to be taken account of, and regretfully, rarely is. And the starting point for that 
and is that everybody, everybody, and for the avoidance of doubt, this includes children, has the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This is in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and of course is reflected uh, in the language that you have used in the declaration that you were discussing uh, um, to, to take forward out of this meeting. It is an absolute right and it is not subject to any form of restriction, that element of having the right to thought, conscience and religion. Of course, the manifestation of religion or belief, as is the exercise of freedom of expression and everything else of this nature, is subject to forms of legitimate restriction, but the absolute nature of that freedom itself is not in question. Now, the significance of this freedom, again, has not uh, been in, in, in perceived as being in much doubt. Um, from a legal perspective, the words which are most often um, used are those which were used by the European Court of Human Rights in the first case in which it ever considered um, freedom of religion and belief, the case of uh, Kokinakis and Greece, where they summed up the overall issue as being one like this. The freedom of thought, conscience and religion is one of the foundations of a democratic society. It is, in its religious dimension, one of the most vital elements that go up to make the identity of believers and their conception of life, but is also a precious asset for atheists, agnostics, skeptics, and the unconcerned. The pluralism indissociable from a democratic society, which has been dearly won over the century, depends on it. In other words, the idea of the freedom of thought, of conscience, and of religion is seen as foundational to the entire enterprise of a flourishing democratic and liberal democratic society. But when it's couched as a right, certain things flow from this. Largely, that the state not only has the responsibility to refrain from interfering with this right, but must also take steps to protect the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion itself. And of course, this also means that no one must be subject to any form of coercion by the state that might impair their ability to have or to adopt or to change their pattern of thought, conscience and religion. Now, as regards children and those who were in the discussion before lunch, um, in one of the sessions before lunch this was touched upon, the, uh, where, where children fit into this framework, the human rights framework is also, you could say, surprisingly clear, and to some, I will admit, no doubt, surprisingly disappointing. But be that as it may, international legal provisions are quite clear that the primary responsibility for the religious and moral upbringing of children rests with their parents or legal guardians, and it is the state which is under a duty to respect the right of the parent or legal guardian to ensure that religious and moral education of their children occurs within a framework which is respectful of their own convictions, be they what they are. What I find a little surprising, arguably unfortunate, in so much of the debate about religious education is that it actually tends to exclude this, we could say, primary rights holder from this field of contestation. It does indeed tend to portray education as a, as a field of debate between liberal values on the one hand and perhaps organised bodies of thought on the other, whether they are religious or non-religious, etc., etc. So the element which is missing from this is actually the place of the parent or the guardian, um, legal guardian itself. Organised religion or, and other organised bodies of thought are often portrayed as seeking to assert itself in an authoritarian, with a capital A fashion, which is to be countered by liberal approaches supported by the apparatus of the state aimed at the fostering of critical reason. Now, we can have a view on that one way or the other. Um, and I've already said on the whole what my position is, which is very similar to, to Stevens. But the parent or the guardian in this setup is nowhere to be seen. 
Now, I fully understand that many find the role of the parent or legal guardian as a primary rights holder in relation to the religious or moral education of the child to be problematic and for some an infringement of the right of the child, um, the child itself. All I can say at this point is that it is, not, that it is not what international law says. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is pretty uncompromising on this, reinforcing the obligation on the state to respect the right of the parent or legal guardian to provide direction to the child in the exercise of the freedom of thought, conscience and religion while taking account of the evolving capacities of the child. And again, this discussion about the evolving capacities is something that was touched on in that earlier debate which you were, you, you were in this morning. It is not the, understood in this way, it is not the role of the state as recognised under international law to ensure a neutral zone until the child is deemed able to be uh, able to determine its own thoughts in the light of the material um, put before them. And indeed, we don't expect this in relation to other matters. So, for example, no one suggests that a child when born should be insulated from, if you like, the questions of nationality or language and all that flows from that in terms of the preconceptions and assumptions that they bestow until such time as they are free to choose what it is they wish to have. If parents or guardians wish to bring up a child within their own belief traditions, be they what they are, and to seek to encourage the child to adhere to them, they are not only free to do so, but, and this is often overlooked, the state is required to ensure that they are able to do so, and that it does not act in a way which trenches on this. It is for that reason that opt-outs are to be provided for children whose parents object to the content of educational curricula, for example. It is not the role of the state to juxtapose itself into the parent-child relationship unless there is complete, clear and compelling evidence that it is in the best interests of the child to do so. And, and this is important, defeating the interests of the parents in the upbringing of their children in accordance with their belief traditions is in itself not a legitimate interest. The extent to which this is frequently airbrushed out of the discussions concerning moral and religious education, or considered to be a contestable proposition, is actually quite remarkable. Indeed, it is notable that the manner in which international law has sought to address the balance which needs to be struck has itself become misunderstood. It has been decided on numerous occasions that whilst parents may seek to remove their children from exposure to religious or philosophical convictions which do not accord to their own, this is limited to exposure what, to what might be called expositions of belief, which I think in terms of your book, Stephen, might be called authoritarianism with a capital A. Um, you know, that is the unquestioned and unquestionable truth. Um, where such material is presented in terms of a more general exposure to learning, then the right of opt-out is already curtailed, even if this troubles the parent who considers it to have an erosive effect upon perceptions of the integrity of the worldview which they espouse and would wish to transmit to their children. This brings us to an important distinction which is foundational for the um, approach which international law has developed and is increasingly used in educational spheres between distinguishing between teaching of religion and teaching about religion and belief. And this opens up an entirely different approach to questions concerning the relationship between religion, belief and education. And it offers, in my view, or can offer a rights-based approach which seeks to fulfil the aims of a liberal approach to education with which, as I've said, I find it very easy to agree, whilst also avoiding many of the pitfalls to which the articulation of that position can sometimes be, be prone. I think it also has the merit of reflecting the internationally recognised legal framework and, of course, of 
being equally applicable to all forms of belief systems, whether they are religious or whether they are not. Now, Stephen brought along a copy of his book. Um, I got a copy of the book, um, but this both, one doesn't both books have my are name on it. Um, sorry. It's both both books are available in the Blackboard Bookshop. Not book the one. Not, not that one. It's not that. Oh, one. okay. Um, I, I'm anonymous in relation to this. Um, one of the other things I've been for some years, no longer, but for about 10 years, I was a member of the Organisation on Security and Cooperations in Europe's Advisory Council on the Freedom of Religion and Belief. And in that capacity, um, we did many things. Uh, one of them was producing the thing called the Toledo Guiding Principles on teaching about religions and beliefs in public schools. Some of you may be aware of this, this, this document, and what it is, is an attempt to get a better grasp of how, in a practical rights-based perspective, these difficult questions which underlie this, um, this area can be um, addressed, and how we can, in practice, find a way of creating the space for an informed discussion about all belief systems in a way which is properly respectful of the positions both of parents and of those who are trying to achieve a liberal with a large L education um, within, a, within, uh, within a, an, a, an appropriate um, educational context. So the essence of the approach has been set out in these um, guidelines. It is important to note that their scope the guidelines are about teaching of religions and beliefs in public, that is, state sector schools. They do not purport to address the legitimacy or otherwise of, let us call it, doctrinal teaching itself within the state school sector, still less do they purport to address doctrinal religious education in other settings. What they do seek to address is how the state ought to approach the education of children about religions and beliefs in the school in which it provides in a rights-conscious fashion and as a means of promoting mutual respect and understanding in the context of a liberal education. And strict to basics, I would say there are three different components to this. The first, in a general sense, is to make a clear case as to why it is important to teach about religion or belief. I think there are objective reasons why it is important that these form part of a, a properly configured educational apparatus. There are, of course, some who just dispute that altogether. But the understanding of the guidelines is that it is important to teach about beliefs and religious beliefs, and I'll just outline in a few moments what they are. The second reason, uh, the second element, is to focus on what might be included in such teaching. Now, in and of itself, those two are probably not surprising. It's perhaps the third, which is the most important, but so often gets overlooked, and is what actually the bulk of this rather lengthy um, little thing is, is all about. And that is the question of how such teaching is to be delivered. Much of the debate about religious and moral education in schools tends only to focus on the question of whether it should or shouldn't take place, or what should or shouldn't be within a curriculum. Anyone who is involved in education will know, of course, <coughs> it is how things are delivered, which is at least as important as the what is being delivered in terms of gaining an effective understanding and an appropriate understanding of what is being given and leading to the educational outcomes which you are attempting to achieve. So what the guiding principles try to do is to set out the differing issues that you need to take into account in understanding why it's important, what should be in such a curriculum, but most importantly, how the delivery of that curriculum should be based. Looking at issues to do with teacher training, to do with the settings in which it takes place, and so on and so forth. Time doesn't permit, you'll be pleased to know, me to go through it all in, um, in, in great um, detail. But just to give a flavour, I could at least give an indication of some of the 
general um, conclusions from the, the work as a whole as to, for example, why it is considered important within the educational sector to have better knowledge about belief systems. So, for example, stressing that knowledge about religions and beliefs can reinforce the appreciation of the importance of respect for everyone's right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. Um, and also that knowledge of religions and belief has a powerful, valuable potential of reducing conflicts as a base on lack of understanding of other people's beliefs and encouraging respect for, for, for rights, as well as being an essential part of an education uh, if you are going to properly understand much of history, literature, art, etc., etc., without because without an understanding of beliefs and religions, it's difficult to be able to make sense of much of the world in which we are living. Indeed, there's a powerful case to be made that many of the, 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 the problems that we face in the world today in, in some way trace back to a lack of knowledge and a loss of understanding about things that have been known and have been appreciated. Um, and it may be that while certainly not aligning myself in any way with, let us say, the Melanie Phillips uh, quotes about um, with, unless you have a strong teachings, you will lead to relativism and uh, uh, it leads to relativism and that leads to, to, to moral collapse. I don't go there at all. But I think it is equally true that if you don't have a good knowledge of, of the things that have mattered over time, and shaping the history of the world that we are in, it's difficult to properly grasp and engage with the world in which we, were, which we find ourselves in and the issues which we continually have to face. I remember, for example, as a lecturer, teacher in international law some years ago, uh, 20 years ago, more than that, when the former Yugoslavia broke up into its component parts it was almost impossible to make sense of what was going on to students at that time who had not the slightest knowledge of European history in the 19th and early 20th century. It made no sense to them. But of course, once you did know more about the history and background, you could understand what was taking place around you, contextualise it and understand it better. That is what liberal education is all about. That is why properly informed understandings of religions and beliefs, and indeed, yes, their positions over time on moral issues, is important. What I absolutely agree is important is that they are not projected in a way that implies or suggests that they are moral absolutes to be accepted or rejected on their own, rather than information which is to be critically engaged with. And so as I draw to a, a conclusion, the point I really want to make is that adopting an approach as found in the guidelines um, and a rights-based approach moves us in a very different direction than that of, shall we say, pitting the state against the parent or religions and beliefs against liberal education, non-liberal education, etc. That in itself is a caricature of what is being presented, I know, but it is the way that these arguments are so often understood by those who do not wish to understand them. And so an approach which puts it in a different way is, I believe, helpful to, to everybody. It is an approach that seeks to make the state, through its role in relation to education, a partner in the formation of the child whilst respecting the interests of the parent or guardian just as the parent and guardian is to respect the responsibility of the state to convey knowledge which is germane to the child's formation in a balanced fashion and which encourages mature engagement with the issues raised. I don't think this is helped by asking whether the child ought or ought not to be respectful of authority or of some authorities anyway. Respect for others should always, in my view, be encouraged. It's not the same as agreement, still less is it unthinking deference, but I think it's a very good place to start. Just because not all views ultimately command respect, um, it still remains a very good place to start one's thinking. And I think this finds its clearer, clearest reflection in the questions of how such material is conveyed, as opposed to what is being conveyed. 
It is the interplay of these questions, the why, the what, and the how, particularly the how, accompanied by this acceptance of the why that um, I, it, it is, provides a way that I think can give us a better way forward when we are thinking about the teaching and the moral education of young people. It is important, that, therefore, that sensitive and rights-respecting approaches to these issues are pursued, and I think it is through this paradigm that they can most usefully be sought. So thank you very much. a lot of ground um, between those two presentations. So what I'm going to do now is just open it straight up to the floor for questions for our speakers. Um, and can we start, who's got the mics? We have mics here? No, we don't, okay. In which case, just shout your question. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I, I was thinking the talks were very good from a theoretical, but not a very practical point of view. I'll give uh, mm -hmm. Well, um, the first thing uh, to, to say is that um, from a legal point of view, it is quite clear that there is no obligation on a state to provide education of particular types which accords with the particular religious or philosophical beliefs of, um, of, of individuals. Um, so there is no ground for simply saying we want to have schools provided that pursue thought pattern X, and the state has to say, OK, we will make, we will make them available. Um, not, and certainly uh, not available to, should we say, everyone on a, you know, on a, you know, so that they are easily accessible. The points that you would make would also, of course, be applicable to many who would, from, a, you know, from many different sorts of backgrounds, who might want particular faith-based education of a particular type that isn't available within a particular sector on its, on its, on its doorstep. Um, and so, in a sense, you always run into this, this, this practical difficulty of what is or is not going to be um, available. And that ultimately is what the idea of opt-outs are designed as far as they can to achieve. I'm the first to accept that opt-out systems are not in necessarily very workable in practice. Uh, and there are many things which are not desirable about them. But in a world which often is dealing with the least worst, one simply has got to try to find the most practical solutions to the, uh, to, to the issues um, that, that they are. But I think to start from, the, to start from a working basis that, you know, to be honest, that says that everyone ought to be able to have the school of their choice teaching things as they would wish them to have them within easy, easy reach of them is just not plausible. No, no, yeah. okay, got it. So, well, I don't mind if they get a religious based education. Mm. Stephen, would you advocate for um, humanist schools? No, um, I want the state to get out of the religious education business. I mean, I, I want, I think they should, of course I agree with Malcolm that uh, it's very important that young people be exposed to religious perspectives and points of view, that they have some understanding of our own Judeo-Christian culture and the way in which it's influenced our institutions and, our, and the way in which... <coughs> Morality has been shaped by that. If you, if you don't have that background knowledge, you're, you're, you're seriously lacking, it seems to me. So, of course, that should be a part of any rounded 
um, education. But it shouldn't be delivered in an authoritarian way. Now, these are the truths and you will accept them. That, that's what I'm objecting to. Having said that, um, it seems to me that the... I, you know, I'm a secularist. As a humanist, I'm a secularist. That means that I believe that the state should be neutral between religious and non-religious perspectives. It should not favour one religion over another, nor should it favour a religious perspective over a non-religious perspective. I, nor do I think that it should favour a non-religious perspective over a religious perspective. Humanist schools, it seems to me, where you have no faith schools, that would be unacceptable. I wouldn't want that. But nor do I want religious schools where there were no humanist schools. I think the state should just get out of the business of delivering faith education. <laughs> Um, because there's no mics here, could you make sure you speak loudly, please? Um, as far as uh, parents being allowed to choose what their, uh, their kids learn or not, I can totally understand uh, in things like, things like religion, which is to, to a certain amount, to a certain extent, a matter of opinion. Uh, but what about when religion uh, openly is, is against, uh, say, something like science or history, which is more objective in its... Uh, it, it, in its nature, I'm, talking, I'm thinking about creationist uh, parents who would not want their kids exposed to, you know, evolution, the Big Bang, anything that suggests that the world is more than 6,000 years old. But if you don't allow that, why not allow parents who don't want history taught because they want to deny the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. like that? Okay, well, is my, is my mic on? So um, the gentleman was making the point to, if you are going to uh, make sort of allowances for religious groups have their own schools, then why not uh, for creationists, people who hold more extreme views, or for those people who are Holocaust deniers, why do they not get their own system as well? Hmm. Um, I mean, it's I a question for Malcolm, surely, because I don't think that there should be, uh, <coughs> be state-funded religious schools yeah. at all. So. I, I think we need to be careful. When I, I'm not talking about faith... You know, there's a difference between faith schools and religious schools, uh, and I think people tend to blur over um, this, 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 this distinction in, in what's being said. Many of the schools in this country, in inverted commas, are faith schools in as much as they are, shall we say, uh, and people will argue whether this is a good thing or not, um, in as much as they are provided by, in some degree, or have the backing of certain religious communities. It does not mean that the education which is delivered through faith schools is, shall we say, religiously doctrinal in terms of its content and its curricula. That's not the same thing as a religious school which is offering a religious viewpoint. In fact, very many schools are faith schools in that loose sense. And after all, in fact, most, most schools in this country actually started out as what you would call now faith schools who then opted into the state system as a matter of just, just the way it came about. So I think what we're talking about is not um, whether faith schools should be teaching doctrinal religion. The question is how these schools teach about things like science, etc., creationism. It's not a question of whether you should have creationist schools, but what about parents who object, for example, to science uh, teaching um, about evolution, if you want to use that example, rather than creationism. And that, of course, is where the point comes in about not being able to opt out or require ch allow children to be opting out of education, which is, shall we say, giving general information rather than doctrinal information. You would simply, in this country, not be able to get, I think, an acceptable um, opt-out as a parent from appropriately delivered education about um, you know, evolution, for example. Of course, what would be problematic if the person teaching about evolution said, of course, there are these religious nutters who don't believe any of this, and that, of course, is a load of complete rubbish and don't have anything to do with that, this is the way, you're back into the authoritarianism. What you have to do, of course, is teach about it, explain it, this is what evolution is about in a way that isn't projecting it as the, you know, as a, should we say, to the exclusion of others. You don't have to mention the others. That is the difference. 
and I know people don't, and it's not saying, oh, there is this acceptable alternative, but it is not projecting that view in an authoritarian fashion because, as Stephen has said, you shouldn't be presenting anything well, in an no, authoritarian fashion. I focus fashion. specifically on morality and religion. Science is mm -hmm. a slightly different case. Is it? Yes, it is. Um, the, it's a very complicated issue, um, and I, I'm aware that if I pursue this, at all, really, mm -hmm. I'm going to open up a can of worms and it's going to become too complicated. But look, so, so here's just a simple thought experiment <coughs> that I think sheds some light on our current situation so far as state-funded faith schools are, are concerned. And the way in which so many of us seem perfectly comfortable with the arrangement, um, when actually, in reality, we shouldn't be nearly as comfortable as we are. Um, so, for example, suppose that political schools opened up and down the country. So in Basildon, a neoconservative school opens up. Uh, in, in Romford, there's a communist school and so on. These, these schools begin to open and parents can choose to send their children to the, the kind of school that they, they would like their kid to go to, a, you know, a, a neoliberal school, whatever it might happen to be. And these schools uh, begin each day with rousing political anthems right? and pictures of political leaders and thinkers beam down from classroom walls. And the schools select the teachers and staff on the basis of their political affiliation, right? And there are readings each day from political texts. Uh, would that be acceptable? Would that be morally acceptable? Would that be a good idea? It seems to me that would be a terrifically dangerous thing. These schools are the kind of schools that you get under totalitarian regimes, right? Cross out the word political, write the word in religious, the state funds them right now. And they are political schools because they are promoting political points of view. Many religious perspectives are highly political perspectives on gay rights, on the role of women and so on. The fact that these schools exist, and we all somehow just think, oh, that's fine. It's the anaesthetic, I'm afraid, of familiarity. Well, OK, so many, not everyone in this room, but so many of us feel, perfect, oh, it's all perfectly all right. This is all, this is all, it's been like this for forever. It's the anaesthetic of familiarity. We don't see how suspect this all is because we've just kind of become used to it, and it's the status quo. Well, I think we should be challenging the status quo, so I would encourage you to use that kind of thought experiment to get people to think about this in a slightly different way just to shake them up a little bit. What is... Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I want to go back to the state school system and the problems of religious education mm -hmm. or of uh, parents with, from different religious or believing backgrounds and what happens there. Not in science only. That's mm -hmm. mostly not the problem. The problem is mostly concerning anything that has to do with any kind of so-called moral education in that system, for example, sexual education. Yeah? And then what to do when parents don't want their kids being educated about this part out of religious reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, the German system has a clear answer. You have to go, mm -hmm. period. Because at this is simply providing an important knowledge about that human being and its facilities. Values can still then be taught at home about how to deal with it. But it has to be, first of all, given the knowledge. The kids have to have the knowledge. That's an answer the German system has developed over and so there but are no religious opt outs in Germany? They cannot opt out. Right. Mm -hmm. Which, yep. of, course, of course, in the UK, there are opt outs. <coughs> not any. Mm. Yes, I I exactly. And that's the way to go about it. There will always be a debate about then looking at the detail of the curriculum and the way it is which it's delivered. Because, as I say, it's not only what is being taught, it is how it is being taught that can make the difference. Um, for example, there were cases before the European Court con uh, concerning Norway, for example, which had a compulsory curriculum that had issues to do with um, 
faith, and it was a very difficult one that required quite a lot of detailed examination of the detail of the curriculum and also how it was being delivered to understand whether or not it could be appropriate simply to require the pupil um, to, to be there. In this case, it was decided it was appropriate to require the, um, no, it was decided it wasn't appropriate to require the pupil to be there because it was leaning too much towards projecting a certain set of values. But that is, if you like, very, it's all, almost always having to going to be a difficult one that you've got to determine on the facts from a balanced evaluation of what is being done. Just a very quick comment because we haven't got much time left. The quick, quick one on the Norwegian one. The Norwegian uh, got collected for doing this, for being faulty in uh, having their uh, religions taught in school. But the, the, the thing the schools did was they took it out of religion and put it into tradition. And now everybody has to go to church now. <laughs> 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 right, okay, thank you. And Van Blue Shirt. Um, in, in Britain, I fear that we are victims of the, um, unwitting victims, of the mostly harmless nature of the Church of England. Um, <laughs> in the last many decades, Church of England schools are authoritarian with a small a and liberal with a big L. Hmm. Uh, and they produce generations of atheists <coughs> as a result. <laughs> <laughs> Our third-line politicians, mostly educated in those schools, do not see that there is another echelon of religious school, which yeah. is not mostly harmless. Mm. And they are entirely blind to that risk, continuing to increase the number of faith schools because the privileges of the Church of England give that right to all the others. Yeah. We need to campaign vigorously for a secular education. Yeah. <laughs> Do remember that when the IPPR made the recommendation that children should be encouraged to think about the worldviews that they bring with them into the <coughs> classroom, the Telegraph was incensed, and so was Melanie Phillips, and so are many other people, because they know that many schools would be structurally incapable of accommodating that, shall we say. I mean, very many schools. They know that they need to pay lip service. Right, to freedom of thought and expression. And so I've had interactions with, for example, the head of uh, an Islamic school. Uh, I've had a conversation with him in which he said, oh yes, we encourage our children to think and question. If you came into my school, you'd find thinking and questioning going on. And I said, well, great, can I, can I come and talk to your kids then and perhaps talk to them? No. <laughs> no, you must be joking. No, that's completely unacceptable. Why? Because they are very carefully controlling and manipulating those conversations and those discussions and the way in which thoughts are being expressed. They know they have to pay lip service to free thought and expression, but they're not really respecting freedom of thought and expression. Why is it that, uh, to go back to the Daily Telegraph, there was a poll, I don't know how reliable it was, but there was a poll done a, a few years ago of young British Muslims, a third of whom thought that the appropriate penalty for leaving the faith was death. Now, how many of them would have gone to state schools? Right? Why on earth are those state schools not challenging those perspectives? Why on earth are British schools not saying, you know, make your own mind up. It is your free choice. You do not have to accept the religion into which you were born or that your parents happen to have. Think about it. If this is your free choice. They simply don't understand that. They probably had very little exposure to that kind of thought. That's the kind of critical thinking, it seems to me, that we should be encouraging in our schools. Our schools need to meet certain minimum standards, and very many of those schools are not meeting those minimum standards. There's lots of fine talk, but when you actually look at what's going on, it is not what should be going on, it seems to me. Um, we've got the lady in the yellow top standing...
No, absolutely. Um, can this lady in the, in the grey top? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. It's tempting, isn't it, to um, use our own particular bet noirs when this kind of conversation came up. My particular bet noir, of course, is the Catholic Church. <coughs> Excuse me, now I'm going to lose my voice. <coughs> I was one of the people who gave evidence to the case of the rights of a child in the, uh, the UN last year mm -hmm. against the Holy See. I was also went, once again went in January to give evidence against the Holy See uh, for the Committee Against Torture. Now on both occasions, those particular snakes slithered out of any kind of responsibility by saying, in terms of behaviour, it was the response, or it was the children, the parents who were responsible for education taken to task on various counts of breaches of the rights of the child, like the right of the child to have, have a, a comprehensive education. Mm -hmm. The problem is, of course, is those children's parents that they're giving that responsibility <coughs> to are equally indoctrinated mm -hmm. by the, the, the people who are in this particular position. I just wondered what your feelings were, and I know it's going off in the tangent, I mm -hmm. apologize for that, mm -hmm. about the Holy See being a member state at all of the United Nations mm -hmm. and actually sitting in this position where it has access to a vast amount of children's minds mm -hmm. within schools and just generally because of mm -hmm. their indoctrination. Mm -hmm. Well, um, all I will say about that is that... Okay, it was a... Right. Um, do you want to try to summarise the question? Yes, it was about the, uh, the validity of the, ho um, the influence of the Holy See um, and being members of uh, various, well, obviously being a member of the United Nations and therefore having influence um, over children's minds because of the schooling system um, and how unaccountable they are for what they do. Um, well, two things I would say about that. The, the, the first, of course, is that the entire question of the legal standing of the, the Holy See is best described as anom anomalous. Um, uh, let, let's go with anomalous. Um, you know, th 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 there are... You know, you know, there's distinctions drawn between the Holy See and the Vatican, etc., etc., and I'm not, you know, it, it is best described as anomalous. Um, now, whatever view you take about, about that, um, I'm not sure that it follows from what you say that it gives them a privileged position in relation to this. In fact, it probably gives them a worse position because they are called up in exactly the way that you describe to have to face those forms of questions and scrutiny which perhaps other organisations, other religious traditions do not have to face or other bodies that may have influence over the way um, schools, um, uh, schools and education um, takes place. Clearly states do appear um, before those, but you know there may be other forms of, shall we say, um, um, you know, belief systems which are responsible for the propagation or because of the influence that they may wield can shape education in a certain way that remain unaccountable because they are not able to be questioned in the way that um, that the uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child Committee of Torture could at least raise those questions. What you seem to be suggesting is because they had that position, they were able to avoid those, uh, uh, avoid those problems. I have to say I'm not entirely sure that that would be the, uh, 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 how that would, should be assumed. Oh yeah, that, that's the anomalous bit. But in terms of their accountability before the UN mechanisms, they are. Yeah, well, clearly that is unacceptable. You know, if you're acting as a state, you are you you are a state. Um, no, you're, you're right on that one. I'm I'm agreeing with you. Okay, we only have time for one more question. So go with this lady here. Thank you. Um, in answer to Malcolm's point, I think surely that all schools would be to explain evolution as a scientific, scientific-based, <coughs> yep. evidential yep. conclusion that we've come to, mm -hmm. and explain that there is also a theory called creationism, mm -hmm. which is totally devoid of experiment, uh, experimental evidence, and I want the children to make up their own mind. Mm -hmm. But the question I was, I was going to ask, related to the, the ladies there, was that the United Nations 
Charter on the Freedom of the Child, 1991, Article 14, says that children must be educated, not indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. Why are our schools allowed to carry on indoctrinating? <coughs> can they not be challenged on this? Or can we just ignore the United Nations Charter? <laughs> No, you certainly can't ignore the United Nations Charter, but I have to say, one has always got to be careful of not characterising anything that one doesn't agree with as a form of indoctrination. You know, one's got to be honest about this. It's very easy to say things I don't agree with that people are told they are being indoctrinated into beliefs. Um, and that is not necessarily the case. And one has got to be careful of stereotyping the way that other people seek to project their views and beliefs. Um, it, after all, uh, he was a bishop, was it, uh, in the 18th century, uh, rather nicely summed it up when we were talking about orthodoxy and heterodoxy, when he said orthodoxy is my doxy, heterodoxy is somebody else's doxy. Um, you know, and that's the problem that bedevils so many of these, um, the, these, these, these discussions. And this is why it's always a struggle to find what should be taught in schools, but this is, goes back to the question of how it should be done. And I think if we spent more time focusing on the how competing understandings and visions and, uh, were, were presented in a way in education, rather than which should or shouldn't be, then we might actually find that we are doing more in terms of delivering on the liberal with a large L. Okay, unfortunately we've run out of time, um, but I am going to have the last word on this, on this particular discussion, only to say that um, as a result of BHA campaigning, and uh, our Faith Schools campaigner Richie is actually in the, in the room today. Um, <laughs> evolution is now on the curriculum for primary and secondary school pupils, and it has to be taught, and schools are now not allowed to teach creationism as fact. Um, well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Um, please continue your discussions once you've le left the room. Um, but please join me in thanking our fantastic speakers, Malcolm and Stephen.